So allow me to introduce today's keynote speaker. We're going to go straight ahead. We have a few people joining a bit later. Um, and that's uh, uh, Dr. Jahan Chobanolu. Chobanolu. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. From the uh, University of South Florida. Um, and uh, some of you met with him yesterday. You can see he's a very dynamic speaker coming out of uh, hospitality services. And I think that um, the presentation that he has in store for you today with videos, etc., will prompt a lot of discussion. So feel free to ask questions either during or after. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, May. Good morning. Uh, very happy to be here. Second day is always easier, right? It's a big data conference, but this conference is a small family. Uh, looks like I, I, I met with uh, almost everybody. Hopefully, we'll continue that today as well, too. So it's a pleasure um, to have this uh, presentation in front of you. Yesterday, I learned quite a bit. Uh, it was an amazing day. Uh, got a lot of research ideas. So hopefully, this today's um, presentation will also uh, make a similar impact on your uh, on your side as well too. So big data in service industries, opportunities and challenges is the title of my presentation. The reason is that I simply from uh, service industry. I'm from hospitality, uh, University of South Florida, uh, College of Hospitality and, and Tourism Leadership, which is going to be very soon part of the MoMA College of Business. We are joining with the College of Business there as well. I'm from uh, uh, Florida, as I said. Um, the definition of big data, yesterday uh, we talked a little bit about it, but nobody really knows what it is. I actually uh, try to uh, make a little poll here, uh, but for the time's sake, I'm going to pass that one. But So in terms of the, the definition of big data, uh, I did some research. As a matter of fact, this is my research. This paper, this presentation that you're listening to here, is part of, F of a meta search in big data in business. So when you look at here, at, uh, SAS, SAS defines it this way, right? Big data is a term that uh, describes the large volume of data, both structured and unstructured. So you go to the next one, Wikipedia is a field that treats ways, ways to analyze, systematically extract information, etc. I'm not gonna go, but the point that I'm trying to make is that there is really not many people know what it is. A lot of people, it's kind of like an elephant, right? A person who is blind trying to touch the elephant, they see the, you know, the nose, they say it's a hose, somebody looks at the side, it says it's a wall, same idea, right? A lot of, so, and big data. Yesterday we were talking with a statistician, uh, I don't remember who that person was, but we've been doing big data for ages, right? Data analytics, advanced data analytics. But there are some uh, differences, why it becomes such a buzzword in the last few years, etc. So this is another one. So this one, for example, talks about the three Vs, right? Yesterday, some of the speakers touched that one. But this one talks about five Vs of the big data. So again, there is not a consistent definition or, and Oxford English Dictionary defines it as the data of a very large size. So big data is big data, duh. Right? It's just like very big. How big is it? We don't know. There is also, of course, many, many different things. But let's look at this definition uh, from Funka E. So we constantly produce a lot of data. For example, via social media, public transport, and GPS. But it goes way beyond that. Daily, we upload 55 million pictures, 340 million tweets, and 1 billion documents. In total, we produce 2.5 quintillion bytes a day. That's a lot of zeros. It's ridiculous. We call this big data. But what's actually more important is what you can do with it. To process big data, you don't need huge computers. People work with the cloud, an endless network of normal servers, and powerful algorithms. This way, they can analyze over a million pieces of data in minutes. And the result? Well, for example, video streaming website Netflix analyzed the big data of their viewers, like popular shows and watching patterns. This way, they produced a successful series with the perfect combination of actors, directors, and storyline. Right now, the big data of traffic is being analyzed to develop a car that can drive completely accident-free all by itself. 
And in the future, we can even use the big data of DNA to determine the perfect treatment. This way, curing genetic diseases like cancer would become much easier. And that's just the start. So, as you can see here, it's a lot of big data. I teach technology at, at the uh, University of South Florida. And I always remind myself, like, one million bytes is one uh, kilobyte, and then one million bytes is one megabyte. One thousand megabytes is one gigabyte. One thousand gigabyte is one terabyte. Petabyte, exabyte, zettabyte, yottabyte, it goes like this, right? So, there is a lot of big data. The reason why we didn't call big data big data 10 years, 15 years before is that now there is so many things that generate data that we did not have access before. And why uh, this happens? Because of the internet of things. Now we are connected to internet. The things that generated data that was not necessarily being connected to other devices. That was the huge difference. So this is a working paper. This paper is just about to be done and I, uh, we will send this to a journal. It is a meta-analysis of big data research in business. So uh, I have uh, looked at all the articles that was published between 2013 and 2019 that had the big data in their title or abstract. So if you look at this distribution of articles, uh, again, this is all research articles I'm talking about, right? I'm not in, uh, in the industry. I did not search the industry articles. This is only the articles that are published in Scopus and SSCI journals. Um, and business strategy and performance is one of the highest distribution frequency uh, concept and definitions. People see how much time they are trying to spend just to define what big data is. Uh, healthcare, hospitality, some papers, legal privilege, uh, regulations is, is etc. Smart cities is another one which I will give you several examples uh, a little bit later. And if you look at the research context, you can see a wide area of distribution when it comes to big data. So again, this is uh, from a research that is not even published yet. Hopefully it will be. And then this, the purpose of meta-analysis always, as you know, that is to be able to fill in the gaps, right? To be able to look at the research from 30,000 feet down and see what are the gaps there. So all of these are happening. And what's the reason, right? This all big data is being generated but the, date, the reason is this. Traditional data has always been existent, but now the new data is actually combining a lot of other elements uh, from, from your cell phones to the things that you do when you purchase by using a, a credit card or an online payment method or mobile payment, etc. <coughs> On top of that, not only the things that we are connected to each other increasing, but also the world population is increasing by every second. This is 7.7 .7 billion people on Earth, and this is a really clockometer meter that shows the, the world population is increasing. The more people, obviously, the more uh, items that we are going to use that are connected, the more big data is going to happen. So all of this is, you know, you probably heard this IOT, right? Internet of Things, that's another buzzword. That is now kind of like coming down, big data is becoming big. But this Internet of Things is what makes this all whole possible. older video, it actually, everything that it said, it happened, right? There may be even more of it. So if you're going to buy a refrigerator recently, you are, uh, chances are very high that you're going to go and get a smart refrigerator. Not only it has a computer on it, right? So you can work on it in the kitchen, but it's an RFID scanner inside. It scans how much milk from the weight sensors, how much milk you have left, how, much, how many eggs you have left. 
So if the uh, volume goes into a threshold that you put, which we call in the restaurant as a par value, par value is the value that you need to order more items, and then it will just make uh, send a text message to you that's saying that before you come home, get some milk. As a matter of fact, you can even connect this to, to a grocery store that will deliver to itself by itself. So you don't even have to uh, do anything, right? This is one example. This is, I don't know if you have seen this picture or not, but this is the home of the future uh, that is belongs to uh, Bill Gates. This picture I have taken about 15 years ago uh, when I went to Seattle to Microsoft campus that this home was available at that time there. What it did actually, again, Bill Gates has developed this as a, as a prototype for the future kitchens. It's not here yet, but it's gonna be very soon. What it does is that this kitchen actually scans everything you have in the kitchen. Let's say you come home, uh, it's 6 p.m. and you need to prepare dinner and you don't know what to cook. And it scans everything in your kitchen and then it tells you that what you can cook with the items that you already have. Sometimes uh, don't you hate that you start doing something and then you realize that you don't have enough eggs, right? Or you don't have this, you don't have that, whatever that is. With this one, not only it tells you what you can cook, but also tells you step by step uh, how to cook that one as well too. So when you take this internet of things, right, the big data, compilation of data, into the safety, Denver police, Colorado police actually have tried this scanner, which is on the top of the police car, and as the police car drives, it just takes pictures of the tags and then tur turns that into text and then uh, database um, goes back to the database and then it checks if that uh, person is being uh, taught for anything. And they have actually got 817,000 uh, people got um, taken, you know, for whatever reason that is, right? So this is another way. And street lights become smarter, right? We used to just give the lights. Now they are actually giving, uh, telling us a lot of different things. The air quality, of course, surveillance, uh, and parking availability, right? They are like checking and telling us to be able to do. Chicago Pirates have done. Many cities around the world are doing it. Uh, and then, of course, the smart technology, IoT, goes into the lives of the handicapped people. Uh, this particular device has connected to the traffic lights. It allows that person to cross the crossing uh, so that they don't have to be you know, in danger. And of course, these street lights learn the behavior to be able to observe if there is a handicapped person. Later, even though this uh, uh, wheelchair is not uh, smart, that they will be able to accommodate that <laughs> as well too. I don't know if you've seen this or not, but this is from China that they are actually trying this in many different high schools. Uh, Dr. Wu here is from China, so he would probably know. I didn't see it at the universities, but China is a highly surveillance country, right? You, you go everywhere and then you kind of like even feel it. I teach actually in the you know, University of International Business and Economics, uh, where Professor Wu comes from. And there, you can see that there is a camera in everywhere. But for a reason, and again, we, most of us are here educators, that they actually uh, do this. China has made plans to become a global leader in artificial intelligence. It has enabled a cashless economy where people make purchases with their faces. A giant network of surveillance cameras with facial recognition helps police monitor citizens. Meanwhile, some schools offer glimpses of what the future of high-tech education in the country might look like. Classrooms have robots that analyze students' health and engagement levels. Students wear uniforms with chips that track their locations. There are even surveillance cameras that monitor how often students check their phones or yawn during classes. These gadgets have alarmed Chinese netizens. So you get this, actually, there is a camera which detects the face of the students and then you'll be able to see if the student, uh, this one doesn't work here, but when it, he or she is awake, when he or she is sleeping. Uh, not only this goes to the teacher, but also to the parents. So it tells that your child was, 30% of the time was sleeping. What's going on? But take this, flip this, right? Talking about smart data here, uh, big data. 
Well, actually, this takes the attendance automatically, and you can see the activity level uh, of the students. It also, imagine that this is being done in our schools. And imagine that 50% uh, of the kids that we teach are sleeping, or they are not attentive in the class. What does that mean for the teacher? Right? How is that data can be used to be able to tell that, hey, when a particular professor teaches the same subject, 85, 90% of the kids are alert. The same subject is taught by Professor X, and now majority of the class is dreaming. Is there anything here for the professor to be able to take into the consideration there, right? So face deals, uh, talking about big data. Uh, this is being started to be used now in America. Face deals is a camera which is attached to a restaurant's door or a hotel or for that matter any kind of establishment. As you walk there, it takes a picture of you instantaneously within seconds that it recognizes who you are, especially if you opt in. You know, yesterday David uh, did an excellent job about telling us just a simple like is not a like, right? It tells a lot of things about us. And then it was public, now it's more uh, restrictive. But yet that if you are going to, if you're on Facebook, if you're on social media, and if you are using your uh, face as your profile picture, then it's very easy to match that and then actually cater the offers to you. You know, I say this because in China, I don't know if you know, it's cultural, right? Many people don't put their picture on their profile. If you were to use a WeChat, most of your friends are going to put a monkey or flower or a landscape picture as their profile picture because it's culturally not acceptable. Whereas in the Western countries that we have this a lot. Let's see how this works very quickly. So this is actually, why is it not acceptable? So do you mind, I'm just curious. Well, uh, I, 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 mean, I, I mean, we have some Chinese uh, uh, scholars here. Yeah. They can probably tell, but they so just simply do like don't feel... Or something? They don't feel comfortable, so they put oh, something no. different, right? Oh, they just no. they just simply don't feel comfortable. Uh, what it's not called? Comfortable with the surveillance. It's just yeah. a cultural thing. People it's a cultural thing. Nothing about the surveillance. Yeah. Surveillance, yeah. Yeah. surveillance yeah. happens anyway, uh, even if you like it or not, don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> so this one, uh, this short video tells you, shows you how face deals work. Please watch this. And I'm going to connect the dots in a second, okay? We're, we're going there. This is actually exactly what happened in real life. A customer would just walk into an establishment like this, just like normal. Uh -huh. And See, these people go, face deal have seen that. That's right, when we walk in, we'll start deciding. They just walked in. Okay. And this will actually be the moment when, ah, I got a deal. I, I got, got I don't know something text messages. came up on my phone. Welcome, Leslie, get a free Diet Coke with purchase of a Caesar salad. And of course mine is welcome day, buy one, get one free Sweetwater 420, which is an Atlanta beer, which I love. So how did it know that I'm a Coke person? What, why is this a Pepsi? Prior to coming into the door, you would have created a profile with face deals. And in that profile, you would have shared likes and preferences, and one of them would have been Coca-Cola. Or we could just, you could give us access to your Facebook page, and we see that you like Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. and then that would be the deal we'd serve up for you. So I would, but I'd give you permission to Absolutely. go to my Facebook page. If you opted into Face Deals, join as a member, I and see. then give us permission to look at your Facebook likes, that's how that would work. I hear you. You see that, right? It's interesting to be able to, obviously there's an opt-in, right? You need to be able to do it, but take it to the next level. This is a Chinese university. Actually, it asks the students, uh, again, from China. I, I, I spend a lot of time in China. I do have several visiting uh, professor appointments in China. Uh, for that reason, a lot of the examples come from there, but also a lot of um, new technologies are being developed there. So this is a QR code. The student goes into the dormitory. They don't have the hot water 24-7. They're usually times are limited, and then they go and they scan their QR code from their WeChat, and then the water starts coming. Not only the water starts coming, but their parents actually get a report how much gallons of water they use to wash themselves. <laughs> you are, you're laughing, but I'm gonna connect the dots a little bit later, okay? Look how this is going to impact the health of the human beings in a second, okay? So I know this is, looks sometimes a little bit too much, but let's, uh, let's get there in a second. So smart payment systems also too, right? China, again, is far 
than America at least. I don't know about, I can't speak for Europe, but for, for America, we still use plastic credit cards, right? Which is non-existent in China anymore. To a level that you can even live in China, like I do, I have my, you know, um, WeChat, uh, I have also wallet in WeChat money, and I can live in China without a cash months, maybe years. To a level that, the other day I was actually walking on the streets of Beijing, and then a beggar, come and stop me, ask me money. Right now I have a little bit of money, but at that time I didn't have any money in my pocket, so I, I said, sorry, I'm a poor academic, don't have any money. He said, don't worry, you can just scan my code. Yeah. So I gave him five RMB. I, I couldn't say no, because I have WeChat, like this. So now this is the payment level. Isn't that funny that even <laughs> Try this. If you go to China, and if you're not Chinese, obviously, if you're Chinese, you, chances are very high that you already have WeChat. Uh, download WeChat. As a matter of fact, David also downloads WeChat when he goes to China himself. But look at the smart payment systems, and that is all connected to the big data, right? The minute that you do that, everything is recorded. On the streets, you go buy a piece of watermelon. For three RMB, you can use your WeChat to a level. The next one is actually creating the problems for it, right? Now it's really great, a lot of convenience, but when you pay actually somebody, you show them your code, actually somebody is taking a picture of your code and using that code later to pay. So security problems happen. Or look at this, this was big in Beijing. So this is the uh, shared economy, right? You share the, uh, you get the bikes. And then here, to be able to get this bike, you need to scan this QR code, which then you pay 300 RMB deposit to be able to take that bike, drive it, ride it, whatever, and then you drop it to wherever you want to do, and it charges you. Actually, uh, a gang came into the streets of Beijing at the middle of the night. They actually replaced all these QR codes with their QR codes. So in the morning, people who would like to rent this bike, they scan the code, thinking that they are sending $300 to the bikes company they actually sent to this gang. So they got millions of RMB in one night. So now they are thinking about what can we do to prevent this from happening. And this is happening in China. Face payment. This is me using my face to get into a convenience store in China where you can buy food through facial recognition technology. Using your face to buy food is already a reality. Here's one system that KFC and Chinese search engine giant Baidu implemented in China. KFC's system even remembers your face and food preferences. KFC, remember, look, it only not only remembers your face, but also what you have ordered in the past. As a matter of fact, you can take this to the next level, which I am working right now, is that if you have any allergies, if you are Muslim, any item that has pork will disappear from the menu. If you have diabetes, any item that has sugar will disappear from this menu, right? Ooh, didn't mean to do that. This is me using my face to get into a convenience store in China where you can buy food through facial recognition technology. Using your face to buy food is already a reality. Here's one system that KFC and Chinese search engine giants Baidu implemented in China. KFC's system even remembers your face and food preferences, so it can better recommend you new products. Much like KFC, this convenience store we visited in the city of Shenzhen has partnered with a tech giant, in this case, the payment app WeChat Pay, to create an experimental face-to-food experience. The store, Zhou encourages people to play and pay with facial recognition technology. With just your face and a simple thumbs up, the system will do... You know, Westerners think that all Chinese or Asians look the same. But when you have the face recognition, it doesn't look the same. By the way, all Asians look, all the Westerners look the same as well, too, so just like we do. Yeah. So on the, on the other side, yeah, which is interesting to me. Smart city applications, right? IoT, we're talking about big data. 
This is started to be used in golf clubs in America. So it's smart technology where you can actually put a sensor. I think I have a picture over here for a golf course that you put this little sprinkler system that goes on the earth. It detects not only the humidity in the uh, earth, <coughs> dirt, but also works with the weather systems to be able to see if it's going to rain. If it does, then it doesn't water, right? It saves about 40% uh, water from this one. Uh, to do a level, uh, to the way to do uh, water and electricity meters. Not only it obviously reads what, how much you consume, but also it gives you uh, some predictions about how much you are going to use for whatever happens in that particular thing. Here, this is another IoT technology which generates big data, is actually used for uh, drinking water safety. This is robotic eel that actually swims in the water, takes the water, tests this automatically, and then sends the results to uh, authority. You can, as a user, to be able to get the, the results. They also use this in beaches in Florida. So you can actually download an app. You can see how clean the water is. Watch how this works. Very cool. So this robotic eel goes into the lake, let's say drinking water reservoir, reservoir uh, takes the water automatically and randomly in different places and then it tests inside. So every single um, wagon is a tester. Goes over there. Toilets. You know this toilet, right? I'm sure that you have seen Toto. Some of you may have used, there's even a remote control for it. You push the button, it washes you, it dries luxury. you. Mm. Luxury, very much. But not anymore, right? And it's not just like this wow factor when you're doing your number one or number two. It actually goes into the next level. It actually analyzes what you do. When you do number one and number two, it tests that and you get an email with the, all the results. Seriously. This is, this is going to save a lot of lives. Doctors, and I'll show you some examples. Doctors are working on majority of the health problems are happening because of simple urine test, lack of urine test. This is going to do your urine test every single day, like this. At the Royal Society's Summer Science Exhibition in London, Researchers explain the technology might help people self-diagnose conditions, alter medication levels, or perhaps even lower their insurance premiums. Insurance. What you see is uh, uh, detecting biomarkers uh, directly in your urine to, uh, to personalize the healthcare directly for your home. The data can be collected far more frequently than occasional blood and urine samples taken by healthcare workers. The results could be automatically sent to a user's smartphone or to a healthcare professional. Okay. It wouldn't be great if uh, uh, moms can detect uh, if their sons are uh, doing drugs or, or if your premium of the insurance company is lower just because you are giving them access to your everyday health you see? data. The toilet tracks molecules between tiny nano balls of metal inside a small chamber. It's there that they are analyzed using a method called nano gas sensing. It is just the concentration of uh, molecules within, uh, so the interaction of the molecules with tiny objects. So to actually, right now, this is really not uh, very um, cost efficient, but. I predict that in 10 years, all of us will have these toilets in our toilets. Not only it's going to actually allow us to be able to check our own health, but other people's health as well. And that's going to be connected to your doctor. The toilet will make an appointment for you when you need to see a doctor. So to that level. And combine this with the water level that you're using, the, the, the quality of the water that you're drinking, all of these pieces. Right, kind of like Steve Jobs, what they, he was saying, that you're connected to dots. So all of these dots are going to be connected together to be able to increase the quality of the life in there. So let's change gears a little bit. What do you see here? Fruit. It's a fruit basket, right? You go to a hotel, this is a hotel, and everybody likes to get one, right? Mandarin hotels actually do that. Regardless if you're a gold or not, you still get a fruit basket. So, sir, if this is your hotel, which fruit would you eat first? 
Um, I think I would go for strawberries. Strawberries. How about you? Maybe apple. You will start with apple. How about you? Oranges. Orange. Orange. What do you take? So, if I were to ask you, what's your favorite fruit? You come to hotel. I ask you this. If I ask you, you would expect that if you say kiwi, that I give you kiwi, but there is no kiwi here, right? You'll be disappointed. Or you may even say if it's a Chinese scholar, or Malaysian, uh, it may say durian. You know durian? Mm -hmm. the, the, oh, yeah. I love it, I love it, by the way. I used to hate it, but now the smell, uh, actually, I love it. I, I actually want to go to Malaysia to attend a durian tour. Like you can go for one week from one durian farm to another. But, so, this is the, actually this is part of a big data project that Mandarin Oriental is doing. What they are trying to do is this, the connection to technology. I always ask my students, what's the connection of this picture to technology? Sometimes they say the robot is a, I mean the apple is a robot, like a machine. No, it's not, it's an actual, actual apple. But this is a standard fruit basket. So what, what the room, um, in the room, uh, room service clerk does that when they deliver this fruit basket then they come back to get it up, they actually observe what you have eaten. And they put that in your profile. Next time you go to Mandarin Oriental, that your fruit basket is dominated by the fruits that you have eaten before. They actually adopt this. It's called unsolicited observation. So big data doesn't always mean that everything is going to come automatically. In this case, the individuals that are trained that this is a valuable information because what happens is that without you are asking anybody, that everything becomes just like the way that you want. Right? And then when you watch TV, IOT, uh, IP TV, Internet Protocol TV, let's say that you are in the hotel, you're watching, and if it is me, I go always to, let's say, CNN, right? And then I go to this. Next time I come to that same hotel, the first, the most frequently uh, watched channels will be the first five, first six. So I don't have to go to the, you know, 255 to find CNN and then this one, that one, right? It's all adopting, connecting the dots over here. To a level that actually you can, uh, we are working on a project uh, currently, and I'm going to show you some of the, my research projects here. This is actually a device that is augmented reality device, right? It just tells you, uh, shows you what you are going to do. Just this one. So you see here, they bring this device to you into your uh, restaurant table, and you can actually see in an augmented reality version what you are going to order. So this takes it to the next level, but also it records what you chose, what are the things that you push. The whole idea here is to be able to show you what you want, but I also would like to manipulate what you order. I want you to order, I was talking to some people yesterday, if you go to a restaurant, the restaurateur does not want you to order steak uh, over pasta. They want you to order pasta because the profit margin of pasta is much larger than the steak. Right? So we actually are working on this project. We are trying to see if big data can help us to be able to manipulate what you order on a table. This research has just been completed in my center, M3 center. Look at this menu, right? Imagine that this is a menu. You go to a restaurant that you take. On the right top corner, you see all these healthy bites. This was actually done to be able to see if I can manipulate you to order more healthy items when you go to a restaurant. On the top uh, right corner over there, that you see the price and the calories. The second one, I put the healthy items on the another direction. In the third one, I don't put the calorie information. See, there's calorie here. And then the fourth one, I change the location again. Then we look at where people are looking with the eye tracking software, right? Uh, we are working with a restaurant company to do this. It's a big chain uh, in America to be able to do that. And then just to understand where people are looking and how much they are looking. This is so interesting because uh, people are actually um, spending some time to be able to do that. And we are uh, successful in actually manipulating what people order uh, by just changing the place in the menu simply. And another research here talks about this. If you look at this, uh, they, they actually have done, look, approximately half of the participants reported they, they had noticed calorie information, only half. If you put the calorie information on a restaurant menu, only half participated, but majority of them did not take that into consideration when they are making. Um, another one, we just finished this research. This was published actually with a, for, with a scholar from Hunan University in China. This is actually to be able to manipulate, again, on Airbnb websites what you are going to book 
even though it may be higher price based on the picture of the host, right? So there is a lot of research goes in there, and I'll show you, this is our model that we have done, host reputation, the photo-based social impression perception, right? There is a theory. When we see first impression, right? When we see somebody, even though we never met that person, sometimes we like a person, sometimes we dislike a person. We never know why, right? You say, I don't like him. I don't like her. Or oh, I love him. Right? We just say this from gut feeling. That's actually coming uh, from a theory. So look at this picture. We actually have done this study in the research that I show you. This is an Airbnb in China. Same room, same hotel, I mean the apartment, the same location, everything is the same. Just the photo of the host is different. Take it to the next level. Look at this. In 2014, Harvard professors actually have done this similar study to be able to see that if photos of the people allow you to discriminate. If you were to look at this Airbnb by looking at the host pictures, what they have found, somebody yesterday was talking about black people versus not right, and then you even like felt that actually they have proved that if you are a black host, male or female, you are 40% or less, less likely to be booked by other people. Even the black people discriminate on black people. They want to rent the rooms from the white or other uh, region. It's interesting, right? These all coming together. Uh, this is another uh, of that one. This is our new research. This research is also just finished. We sent that to our graduate student conference in, in, in Las Vegas next January. What we have done is the scarcity theory, right? We are working with a company. This is actually called Hotel Runner. Hotel Runner is a booking engine company. They are in 185 countries. Imagine of booking.com, but a little bit uh, smaller than them. They actually work with booking.com. What we are working with them is an amazing project, is the scarcity, right? There's two theories. Uh, frenzy theory, if something is very scarce, that you are likely to give more money, right? The value, perceived value in your mind is much bigger. We all know that. The other one is quality <coughs> theory, same idea, that if something is very little, limited quantity, that's why there's all these marketers are using this one. We actually do this. Look at what we have done. This is actually a real hotel system that we're working with Hotel Runner. And this was an experiment that we start putting the red items here. Hurry up, last room. 256 euro versus 135 euro, right? We put these things in, um, in a period of six months, right? And then what we have found, pre-treatment, so there is no um, scarcity. There is none of these, right? It's just like the list of the people that come to book the room. And what we have found that the number of people who come to the website did not change, 4,800, 4,800 before and after. But what has changed is total available searches, pre-treatment, and total bookings, look at this, 55 to 189. So that's a significant increase. So uh, this is look to book ratio. People book, but they, not, they don't book, right? So there is a uh, conversion uh, uh, metrics that we use in hotel industry. So again, uh, 0 0.01 to 0 0.06, that uh, increased six times. Conversion pre-treatment to conversion post-treatment. You can see that here with the help of, again, this is big data, doesn't have to be complicated, but right? that you're using all this information. Now we are actually coupling this, this research with the quality of the pictures in the hotels. We are going to uh, test to see. It's from the business perspective and they allow us to publish this paper, by the way, uh, because the son of uh, this company's owner is my student. So speaking of connections, <laughs> normally getting access to data like this is not easy. I'm almost there. So there is a lot of big data companies. We already talked about this. In different industries, big data are being used. Let's just talk a little bit about the industry. Telecommunications, financial services, and healthcare are the big users of big data, and majority of these companies. And as you go up there, it's easier to use big data. Here in the hospitality is not there yet, but it's going to go there with the, all the examples that I showed you um, before. We already talked yesterday, a lot of people have talked about this. Netflix, you already know, we, uh, some, some of the speakers yesterday gave this uh, example of the Netflix, how they are using big data to be able to um, 
do this. In September 2014, we launched Netflix in France. It was a big challenge with such a skeptical public. The only way to succeed was to be perfect. This is the case that is from France. Luckily, we have the most adapted tool, Topics Model. Topics Model is a natural language processing system. It can transform a mass of everyday language into significant insights to identify a brand opportunity. We use this text mining approach to analyze two years of digital conversations and erase irrelevant data, the surface and the noise. It processed the data into different categories of meaning, sometimes from the same source. We use machine learning to train our algorithm to get better. This unique system enabled us to dive into the French mindset. We interpreted all the data with our knowledge of the local market to come up with three essential insights. The French love culture, but they're among Europe's biggest pirates. They love innovation, but they're skeptical of what's new. They love revolutions, but they're very conservative. Basically, we needed to break conventions without asking them to change. Thanks to Topics Model, we decided to create a platform inspired by you and came up with a creative revolution. A campaign made of gifts, inspired by people's everyday life and typical French attitudes, connecting them to a good reason to watch Netflix. Skeptical? Try the Netflix platform for free. That spoiler moment. Watch all episodes of Breaking Bad at once. Frustrated by all the waiting? Watch your favorite series instantly. Also, we use contextual data to address them real-time on more than 8,000 screens. When it rains, during the sales, or the holidays. The French identified so much with the gifts, they put their skepticism aside and started to really love the brand. As you can see here, it's a very uh, successful demonstration of big data use uh, to be able to from different sources and to be able to cater to the needs of an uh, individual target. In healthcare, the same thing happens, big data. I'm almost uh, out of time. Let me just. Uh, Dr. Chan is fine. We're a little ahead of schedule. It's okay. We'll... Okay. And and in the health uh, case, we have seen the toilets, right? Uh, to be able to do the, the the water quality to everything is going in there. So you see more and more uh, health industry are getting the data from health records, imaging data, all the X-rays that people do, patient-generated data, the data that you generate from Fitbits or the toilets that you're using in your, or the blood pressure, sensor data, and other forms data come together to be able to create a better health quality for you. Insurance companies, hospitals, they are all stakeholders here, right? Everybody is trying to get a piece. Insurance companies invest so much in big data, not because they really think of you, they think of themselves. Everybody has to be insured. If you go to doctor less, they're gonna make more money. That's the main incentive. But at the end of the day, it helps humanity, so that's perfectly fine. Right? These are all the different things that generate data in the health industry, which is really changing the way that uh, IBM works with health uh, um, sector a lot. And this is how they work. The world's approach to health is broken, but that's about to change. Medical data doubles every three years. And the $7 trillion health industry is unable to keep up with the staggering rate at which information is produced. From medical records, clinical trials and research, to personal fitness bands, implanted devices, and other sensors that collect real-time data, each of us can generate the equivalent of 300 million books of health-related data in our lifetime. In fact, approximately 35 cents of every dollar spent on medical care is wasted. And yet, there is a reason for hospitals, doctors, insurers, and patients alike to be optimistic about the future. The reason is Watson Health Cloud. The IBM Watson Health Cloud brings together vast amounts of medical data into one centralized thinking hub on the cloud, combining traditional analytics with the advanced cognitive capabilities of Watson, the ability to learn and over time refine its analysis based on what it is learning, to turn this wealth of data into knowledge. Take Raul. Raul has a family, a busy job, and an active lifestyle. He also has a heart condition. It's mild, but it could worsen over time. He works closely with his doctor to monitor the problem, but they have difficulty finding medication that doesn't limit his busy lifestyle. And with the mountain of medical data available, it's nearly impossible to keep up with the latest treatments. Raul's doctor starts using a new app created from the Watson Health Cloud. It allows him to review Raul's personal and family medical history from other doctors, even insurance providers, and incorporate that information with data from Raul's Fitbit. 
This provides both Raoul and his doctor with meaningful insights about his condition over time. Watson Health Cloud operates in an ecosystem environment, as in nature. As you can see from this example is the whole idea is to be able to make decisions better and uh, pharm pharmaceutical clinical claims. And I want to show you um, this, um, let me see, all these benefits we already talked about. Look at this. This is a Google Scholar uh, profile of somebody. Actually, you can probably recognize the last name is my last name. He's my nephew. But if you look at here, what, 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 did you, what would you think that he studied? Look at the articles that he published. Uh, predicting drug target interactions, um, and generally white ionized screen items, potential drug. So he probably studied pharmacy or medicine. What's that? Bioinformatics. Bioinformatics. Actually, he's a computer scientist. He has no relation to medicine whatsoever. He knows machine uh, uh, learning uh, language. And then he works at the University of Texas hospital system trying to find cure for cancer. All he does is that they are using algorithms, big data, to be able to run all these different models to this level. So this is really interesting. And finally, uh, if you were to look at the errors in, uh, you know, my brother is a brain surgeon. Uh, he tells me sometimes that we all make mistakes, right? And doctors are alike too. So Big Data is trying to help them to be able to avoid those uh, uh, the, the, the mistakes that they do. So um, to a level that, I don't know if you have seen this or not, but soon, in about 10 to 20 years, we're going to have these beds. Before you go to bed, this bed is actually going to understand your mood and it's going to make you dream a dream that's going to make you happy. You can actually even tell them that what you want to dream of. What would you like to dream, for example, if you had a choice? Peace on earth. What's that? Peace on earth. Peace on earth. Like for me, probably I would say like I would have six packs, you know, muscles and all that stuff. So to that level. And in the banking industry, the bed data is used huge because their stakes are so big and so high. Yesterday, some of the speakers actually talked about this. Look at this. We generate as the consumer's data from every single co component. Like when you go to a store and you buy a red underwear, people know about that. It's not just your wife uh, or your partner knows about it, but a lot of people know and they make decisions about that as well. Prevention uh, of detection of fraud, consumer customer segmentation and personalized service are the three big areas that big data is used in banking industry. So um, I'm going to just pass this because of the time. But I just want to show you some of the examples from hotel industry as well where big data is used. Now we are working actually with a hotel project. It's called X Room, Experimental Guest Room, where we are actually trying to see if we can change the color of the room based on your mood. Will I be able to make you more satisfied or purchase items that you would not normally purchase in this hotel room? If you are not really fit, can I actually manipulate you to become more active in fitness in your hotel room, etc. These are the things. This is my research we just published about this, but again, we are out of time. I'm happy to share this with you. But we looked at actually big data. We have access to two, uh, about 5,000 hotels financial data. We couple that with the temperature, okay, all the temperature, climate, uh, global climate. And we wanted to be able to see, create a model that if you, the temperature increases, your profits drop or increase, depending, it's interesting results. So we are trying to find the, the value of one degree drop in the temperature in New York, how much profit that's adding to the hotels in Florida or vice versa, right? So that's our uh, research has done. Thank you so much for your attention. And I don't know if you have any time for any questions yes, or comments. But yes, yes. Uh, thank you. I know there's a lot of information, but I tried to cover as much as possible in a very short time. Um, any comments? Yes. Questions? Um, uh, I mean, all these uh, are smart uh, technologies, technologies you mentioned, yeah. like, you know, the smart beds and smart Fire seat, yeah. seat and, and all that. Um, uh, what are the, the security and privacy implications of that? You know, there is a lot. I'll tell you. You know, um, all of these things, Anything that's connected and shared can be shared and connected with anybody. But 
you need to think about that. What would be the reason for anybody to actually hack into your data, right? That's the one thing. Uh, we see this a lot in the, uh, in the commercial institutions. Uh, hackers are interested in credit card data to be able to get that one. Uh, but the other one, the other information, when you go into a hotel, uh, even let's say this bank right, that you're talking about, um, there would be an incentive for people to be able to utilize it. And if there is an incentive, I can assure you that it, nothing is secure. In this world, if people can hack into uh, NSA, CIA, FBI's websites and stuff, uh, nothing is secure. So there is a lot of, you have seen in China, right, with these QR codes that what they are doing to be able to manipulate those things, it is going to happen. I mean, um, think about the biometrics, right? We think that that's very safe. It's less to, actually, fingerprint technology is very easy to duplicate. All you need is a tape, right? I'm sure that you heard about this. You take the tape, you get the print, uh, your fingerprints, and you can put it in a silicone, which is melted, and then you will just create your fingerprint, and it works. Uh, we are also trying this face uh, recognition technology with twins, right? To be able to see even if the twins will be able to detect it or not. So security and privacy is a huge area. Actually, in my paper, the meta-analysis, this is one of the gaps that I have identified. There is a lot of need for this one to be researched by us. But yeah. With facial technology, for, let's say for women who wear makeup, right? What are they actually trying to detect and capture? Because I don't always recognize my own face now. <laughs> so, I mean, but what I'm saying is that how, what are they actually identifying? What Ma makeup doesn't. What, what is it? What is it in face recognition doing? technology, makeup doesn't really make any difference because. Face recognition technology does not really measure what you, you have on your face, but actually the distances between your eye and the eyebrows and, and the nose and the lips and everything else. So it's not 100% reliable yet. That's the reason we don't see too much of it yet. But in my opinion, what we are going to see is that it's going to be a combination of everything. In the future, we all, when we are born, we're gonna to go to the government entities and we're gonna be put a chip inside. And then that will be coupled with the biometric face recognition, iris scan, and fingerprint all coupled together, okay? It will come if it all checks verify, and it's going to happen. Actually, I was just flying here, and I got checked in by a face recognition, right, the first time. And I was watching people as they were gonna, I actually videotape, I was gonna put over here, but I didn't have time to do it. And then uh, when you, uh, people walk in, to the you know machine, it normally is supposed to recognize your face and then go. I think two or three out of ten times it failed. So they actually took it actually caused the line to take longer yeah. than it would uh, cause them. So those are all growing pains of the technology. They are not. It's not mature yet. But again, by 2030, by 2040, will be there. It will be very very reliable, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I mean, I'm happy with the IT transformation, the development that we are living, but uh, I feel a bit scared, honestly. You know, right. I listen to something about microchip or, or recognition uh, phase. I'm wondering whether there would be also an ethical concern about all these things. A lot. Uh, that's the point. I mean, if I go to China, and I know what I've seen, I really, I didn't know what was going on in the other countries and so far from us. So I would be a bit, you know, okay, I want to give my authorizations to, to get, uh, so everything is okay, obviously. If it, 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 it will work to our benefit, uh, to change social analysis, economic analysis, all the other things, that's fine. But honestly, I feel a bit scared. I started feeling anxious, and now I'm scared when you say yeah. also the microchip. So, that's the point, so the ethical concern of privacy also, that's a You have all the rights to be concerned. Yeah. Yesterday when David was telling about his research that Facebook likes was yeah. not public until 2013, right? Yeah. A lot of times that you don't realize, but by just signing up to a social media, you actually give a lot of rights to the companies to be able to share that information. Even when you're walking on the street, that is public domain, right, that you are actually, your face, your movements are scanned by, 
uh, counterterrorism officials, the government, security police, and other uh, purposes as well. <coughs> Is there a way to escape from it? Probably not. I think the key for anybody, any entity, let that be a company, let that be a government uh, organization. The key is to be able to communicate to the user the benefits, right? So if you go to a hotel and you actually, uh, the toilet asks you to scan your fingerprint before you do your business because it's going to analyze you and it's going to send the information to you because these toilets are expensive. We're not going to have them in our homes yet, right? So you are going to make a decision to yourself that will this benefit to me, right? Technology acceptance model. You are, so there is a lot of research needed for this one. But even if you don't want it, you will be exposed to all of these data sharing. It's already happening. The minute that you go, unless you are using cash, by the way, soon the cash even will be traceable to, to you. Um, so that's going to happen. Therefore, there is a lot of research about this needed more to be able to see the impact. To differentiate, I'll just uh, say one more thing to, to end this uh, answer, is that there are some hotels now, uh, Boston Renaissance Hotel. If you go there, it's actually differentiated itself by being a detox hotel, digital detoxation. So people go to that hotel, they surrender all of their uh, devices. It used to be in cruises. If you ever been to a cruise ship, you couldn't actually be connected so that it was meaningless to have a smartphone. But that's very interesting. Another research is needed on the impact of this amazing technology around us. Imagine what you do when you wake up in the morning. In the old days, what do we need to do? What do we used to do before we had the smartphones? We wake up, we wash our faces, we go to the toilet, do whatever it is. We just are not exposed. Right now, I did a research, 90% of my students, the first thing they, they do before they do anything is to check Instagram. How many people like the selfie, you know, <laughs> versus not? If people are jealous, because she can see how many people viewed, but how many people did not like. Right, in Instagram, you can see how many people, you can see that that saw me, but didn't like my picture. So, it's really scary, the impact. There is a social media addiction, right? There is one of my students actually working on it. There is going to be even more that, that's, uh, that's scared, you know, being scared of that being connected to all the time. I think you're gonna see more and more uh, digital detoxation um, products gonna happen. People are gonna actually charge you more money for not being connected. Yes, I just I, last one, right? Okay, uh, go ahead. is it okay? Go ahead. Yeah, please. I just, in your meta-analysis, you had um, words that are mentioned, ethics was little. Very little, that's why I identify yeah. as a gap. Yeah. There is a huge, huge, I mean, I'll give you one more example. You know autonomous cars, right? Everybody's talking about yeah. this, yeah. autonomous cars. Um, so, I was in Las Vegas a couple of months ago, and I wanted to get a lift, you know, like Uber. So I signed up, and then I got an email said that, would you like to be a pilot test taker for our autonomous cars? And I said, yes, there is a disclaimer. If the autonomous cars kills me, I will not sue them, and does all that stuff. I agreed, I didn't get one. There are about 1,000 autonomous cars in Las Vegas now. If you ever go to get a lift, you are very likely to get one of those. But now, you know what many, they are talking about this. There is a research, everybody is scared, but so, if an autonomous car, God forbid, okay, if the autonomous car is coming to this room, who should, if it's going to kill one person, who should it kill first? Should it kill me? Should it kill you or her? Who? This is an ethical consideration. Actually, programmers program this, right? So they did a survey about this, and uh, a lot of people were skeptical about this research that should actually, the first person to be killed is a cat, and an old man, then fat man, fat woman, goes to all the way to the stroller. The last one is a stroller, the baby in a stroller. So, like it or not like it, these are the issues that we need to tackle right now, because they are happening. So, um, there's, there's a book out, which many of you may have read, it came out in 2016 or 2017, by Kathy O'Neill called Weapons of Mass. Destruction and it's, um, if you haven't read it, um, shameless plug for it, it's absolutely fantastic. And it walks through that right. all these algorithms are making all of these decisions for us in terms of, you know, who gets released from jail, 
you know, um, you know, who gets um, certain bank loans, right? And so, and, and you know, as sort of the old guard in the room, um, you know, the, this is all fantastic, but there's, right, it takes a while to catch up. With there is the other side of it, you new technology. Yes. Exactly. But I think finally, there's conferences that are beginning to, to talk about that, and you know, professors that are finally talking about that. So as sort of the, the ex-professor in the room, um, and it's important to include that, you know, in, in this. Exactly. You know, to avoid that. Yeah, right, right. That's, right. So that's the point. point yeah. Is to manage that in the right way, that's the yeah, reason absolutely. why I think so. But I think we're just sort of catching no, up. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Last. Let's, I know we are way out of time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for your, your talk. I want to come back, come back to where you started, defining you data. Because many of the ex extremely exciting examples you've shown doesn't appear to be primarily driven by the volumes. We're not talking petabytes of, uh, of uh, data in many of the examples. Not necessarily, yeah. So what would be, the, why? Do you think they are examples of the, the opportunities from big data? I think, it, as far as I'm concerned, this is personal, that the value of big data doesn't come from the amount of data, it comes from the connectiveness of the data. When you connect the dots, that you will be able to look at. I always look at this like a slice of pizza versus the whole pizza. Right? So when you have this, all these different slices, and if we put them together, you can see the whole sli the, the pizza all together. That's where I think the power of big data comes into. That's why I say that it doesn't have to be parabytes of data, but if you can connect different dots to be able to make a better decision, efficient, faster, cheaper, that's the value, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.